Good evening, everyone. I'm going to ask you to start making your way to your seats, and uh, maybe even if we could kind of work toward the middle a little bit, it would help our singing tonight, if you don't mind the people that are kind of close to you. If you do mind them, I won't tell them. We want to welcome you to the 2023 Truth Lectures. I'm excited about this, been getting excited for a long time, and glad that this night is finally here. I get to come together and open God's Word together, study these great uh, topics and the lessons that have been put together by these fine men and women. And uh, looking forward tonight to starting that off with uh, some time singing together. Uh, we've got a couple of great song leaders here with us tonight, and I know we'll have a good time uh, sharing in that fellowship with one another. Let me give just another moment or two for folks to make their way in. I want to remind you just a couple of things tonight, too, that uh, are going on. We'll have some sales at CEI Bookstore throughout the week. Uh, obviously, we have some books and materials here in the foyer at ABS uh, coming into the auditorium. If there's something that you're looking for that you don't see, don't hesitate to ask our staff, and they'll help you out in any way that they can, I'm sure. Um, and you can purchase things uh, here. If you've got an account with us, we can even do that uh, as well through the, the laptop, the computer's out there as well. So don't hesitate to ask us for what you need, and certainly check out the book. The uh, book is on sale this week for $20, and uh, we'll hopefully sell out of them uh, during the week this week. All right, I think we've got about everybody in that's here for now. I'm going to introduce to you our song leaders tonight. They're from the Eastside Congregation here in Athens. Uh, Brother Jeff Smith will come and lead first, and then after him, uh, Brother Scott Abernathy will lead us. So join with us uh, as we sing together here for about uh, 20 or 30 minutes, and then we'll uh, have our keynote speaker introduced to us tonight. first hymn this evening is Savior and Friend. These are found in the Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs uh, hymn book. We'll sing all three verses. <coughs> Rest of the weary, joy of the sad, hope of the dreary, light of the glad, refuge from danger, strength to the end, home of the stranger, Savior and friend, wealth of the giving, heart of the kind, breath of the living, sight of the blind, path of the lowly, round at the end, bread of the holy, Savior and friend, song of the sighing, lamp of the lead, prayer of the dying, life of the dead, be my endeavor unto the end. Love me forever, Savior and friend. And can it be? <clears throat> Again, all three verses. <coughs> Can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who scorned his perfect love. Amazing love, how can it be that you? Thank you. 
How deep the Father's love. Normally we sing this out of the other hymnal. There's fermatas. There are none on this version. So we're not going to hold out each, each line like we normally do. Just be aware of that. Mm. How deep the Father's love for Searing loss, the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but <clears throat> will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. <clears throat> I 
what did he do? A little faster pace on this one. All three verses. <coughs> in the rest of the week we're going to be singing um, a psalter song it's a it's a um, version of psalms that are chosen in this book that's on sale the one chosen tonight is psalm number 92 these have been written to fit the particular tune that's well known there'll be no music on the screen just words but the tune is my hope is built on nothing less the solid rock so I think we'll be able to pick up on that rather quickly. There's three verses of this hymn. To fit the tune, we have to sing the last line twice, so just be aware of that. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, to give you thanks is good to sing your praise is my delight i tell your mercy to the dawn and laud your faithfulness at night with song prescribed by your commands i praise the work of your strong hands i praise the work of your strong hands how wondrous are your works, O Lord! Not one can understand your thoughts. You let the wicked thrive like grass, then you destroy them with their plots. You are forever set on high before you all your foes will fly. Before you all, your foes will fly. Your grace anoints my head with oil. I watch my foes exultantly. Established in the courts of God, flourish like a cedar tree. The Lord my rock is whom I bless, in him is no unrighteousness, in him is no unrighteousness.
can see, our next song will be number 200, well, 246 in the song book, but uh, Lead Me to Calvary. Told me, King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for thee, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourn and wept. Angels in robes of light arrayed, guarded thee whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Let me, like Mary, through the gloom, turn forth the gift to thee. Show to me now the empty tomb, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee. Even thy cup of grief to bear, thou hast borne all for me. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Our next song will be The Church's One Foundation. Just a note about this song, most of us are probably familiar <clears throat> with the tune that was written by George Webb. Uh, this is a different tune written by Samuel Wesley, both in the 19th century, but usually both versions are in our books, but at least my experience has been we've, we tend to sing the, the Webb version. So this one may sound a little different to you, but it's still a beautiful hymn. Told me the church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ the Lord. She is his creation, my honor and the word. From death he came and sought her to. 
And now, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. <clears throat> Told me, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. sing God bless your church with strength. If you're familiar with the song Crown Him with Many Crowns, this is the same tune. Oh. 
Our last song will be for Christ and the church. Invite those that wish to stand while we sing this one. Oh, me so. For Christ and the church, let our voices ring. Let us honor the name of our long King. Let us work with the Lord in the strength of youth and loyally stand for the kingdom of truth. For Christ, my dear Redeemer, for Christ. For the church, his blood had purchased thy church, his only bride. For Christ and the church be our earnest prayer. Let us follow his path where the cross may bear. Let us give holy zeal to the gospel. In just a moment, Brother Paul Douthat is going to lead us in opening prayer, and then we are going to have the privilege of hearing Brother Kyle Pope speak on one of the keynote lectures of this week, Christ, the, the Church and Her Savior. Uh, the Church of Our Lord is the greatest institution ever established and the greatest relationship that we know here on earth. The home has its blessings, but the home in some ways foreshadows the spiritual relationship we share with a much larger family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. When sin entered the world, God promised that he would deal a death blow to, to the serpent, to Satan, through the seed of woman. And then the promise made to Abraham foreshadows a time when God would bless the entire world uh, through Abraham's descendant, through his seed. And then the prophecy becomes more focused when we get to jo uh, the, the, uh, the tribe of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah till Shiloh come, the one who has the right to weld power. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. And so we have chosen to focus this year in the Truth Lectures on Christ and the church, a vital subject one that is timeless, one that we need to be reminded of, and one that not only do we as, uh, as adults and perhaps Christians who have been serving the Lord for some years need to hear again, but the younger generation does as well. It's a vital and important topic. And so this evening, our brother Kyle Pope will be speaking to us on the church and her Savior. Kyle is a dear friend, a faithful evangelist, 
one with whom I labor on a weekly basis in interacting together in producing the kind of good Bible material that uh, Truth Publications is devoted to, uh, to providing for individuals and churches to help us grow and help us develop spiritually. So we know that uh, we are in for a treat as he speaks to us this, this evening. Uh, but at this time, we're going to ask Brother Douthit, who, by the way, brought our second-born child into the world, and successfully, he's still with us, and so Paul is now is a retired uh, doctor, but we love Paul and Kathy and love his father. I served under his father's uh, leadership. Uh, he was one of the elders in the church at the Warfield Boulevard Congregation in Clarksville, and so we've had a long and, and close relationship with the Douthit family, and he is going to lead us in our prayer, and then we'll turn the podium over to Brother Kyle. Would you bow with me as we pray together? Our Father and our God in heaven, how great thou art. Hallowed be your name. Father, we're so thankful for this occasion where we can come together and meditate upon your word and contemplate the great cost that has been paid on our behalf as we've been reminded in the songs that we've sung tonight that it took the coming to earth of your son who died on the cross gave his precious blood to purchase the church that was in your eternal purpose to establish and the fact that we can be a part of that is knowledge that is too wonderful for us that we can be in the church that we can be part of the body that we can be inheritors of the promises given to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and further strengthened by the word that your son gave to his holy apostles when he was here on the earth. Such knowledge is too wonderful and you are to be praised. Father, we pray your blessings on all who have gathered here tonight and will be for these lectures. We pray for Brother Pope that you would guide him and all of the subsequent speakers, that they would speak only the truth, and that we would be edified by searching your word together and being reminded of how great you are and what a great blessing we have to be seated with you in the heavenly places with your son, who is our king. Again, we pray that you would be with us tonight and that we always strive to please you in everything we do, whether in our meditations or in our conduct of life that we would always give you the praise and the honor and the glory through your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mark. Thank you, Brother Douthat, for that prayer. Thank you for your presence here tonight. I know there are other places you could choose to be, and I appreciate so much that you have chosen to come together tonight to study God's word together. I will make it my aim to set before you not my own opinions, but simply what the Word of God teaches us. And hopefully we'll glorify our God, we'll be edified by one another and by the study of God's Word. Thank you to those that may be watching via the live stream. I was talking with one of the brethren before our time began tonight about how small the world has become. There are those that can watch all over the country, all over the world, and we have the same objective. We hope that the things that we study tonight and throughout this week can edify us and help us to grow in our understanding of the will of our God and Father in heaven. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures tonight, and I would encourage you to follow along with all of those that we consider. I would love to visit with you about any questions you may have after uh, our time together, if there's anything that just doesn't quite seem right, I'd count you as my friend. If you can bring to my attention something that perhaps I've said in a way that's not in keeping with the Word of God, it is our aim to do and to say and to teach those things that conform to the will of God. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24, the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, writes, Wives, submit to your own husbands. As to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 
If you are familiar with the epistles of the Apostle Paul, you will recognize the fact that it's not unusual for him to address matters pertaining to marriage or matters pertaining to the home. What is a little bit unusual about this particular text is that in the course of doing that, he uses it to illustrate some things about the nature of the church. That's led some to imagine that, well, this really isn't teaching anything about marriage. It's really just teaching about the church. I wouldn't go that far. But I do think that it does offer to us some profound things that are parallel one to another. For example, in this text, you'll notice that the submission of the wife to the husband and the submission of the church to Christ, both are said to be in everything in verse 24. And have you ever thought about why that is the case? In this particular text, as it pertains to the relationship between the husband and wife, there's not really an explanation given other than simply the fact that that role is asserted. The husband is the head of the wife. In verse 23, however, as it pertains to the relationship between Christ and the church, that role is asserted, but there's also an explanation that's given. He is the Savior of of the body. I want to show you a picture of the little village of Saint Pierre on the island of Martinique. On May 8, 1902, a volcano erupted on this small island, and what now has been rebuilt, you can see in the color photo, in the black and white photo that was taken shortly after this event, that little village was destroyed. And in just a, a matter of moments, almost the entire village was just decimated. And from what I understand, everyone within the village was killed with one exception. A man by the name of Ludger Silbaris had been in some kind of trouble the night before and was actually put in a prison cell. You can see here the photograph that shows this stone cell that only had a little bit of an opening for air and for light, and yet this very cell became the salvation for this man because when everyone else was wiped out by this volcano, Silbaris survived. But what became his salvation almost became his tomb because he was still alive, but no one knew that he was there because those that had imprisoned him had died. It would be days before those from nearby villages would discover that Silbaris was in this cell, and they saved him. He was badly burned. He was malnourished. He was dehydrated. But he was saved when all of those around him perished. What do you need in your life? I suspect that all of us, as we think about our life and our current condition, maybe there are certain things that your family needs or certain things that you want very badly and you feel like you just need to have those things. I want to tell you, friends, the greatest need that any of us have is we need a Savior. And that's because we have a very serious problem, the problem of sin. The Bible indicates to us that now in this age, this side of the cross, all are, as Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21, under law toward Christ. Now what that means is, that as we are accountable to that law of Christ, if we break that law, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, or we fail to obey that law, James chapter 4 and verse 17, or even if there are ways in which we violate what in our conscience we understand to be the dictates of that law, we commit what Scripture describes as sin. Now, the world we live in treats sin as if it's not really a big deal. I hope that none of us who are here this evening, none of us who are studying these things and thinking about it tonight think that way, because what the Bible teaches is that, con that sin 
is in fact an act of warfare against God. It puts us in a position. Isaiah chapter 5 or 59 and verses 1 and 2 in which we're separated from God because of our sin. It puts us in a condition, as Paul puts it in Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, in which we become enemies of God. Now that is a problem. When we are in a state of warfare with our Creator, how can we ever be delivered from such a condition? Thanks be to God in the love and mercy of God and kindness of God, he has offered a means of divine atonement. Now the problem with that is, if we understand the nature of God, God is described in Habakkuk chapter 1, the first part of verse 13, as of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Think about it. If you've got a God that his nature is pure, how can he have any kind of relationship? How can he have any kind of contact with those who are his enemies, with those who have sinned, those who have been tainted by rebellion? The manner in which that comes about is through self-sacrifice. Jesus would put it this way in John chapter 15 and verse 13, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Why did Jesus come? Yes, he set an example for us of how we ought to live. Yes, he taught doctrines that are unique, doctrines that are special, that teach us the best way to live. But the most important reason that Jesus came is he came to be an atonement for our sins. He laid his life down for our sins. Paul would put it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for He, God the Father, made him, God the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. Now, understand, that does not mean, as some of our Calvinist friends have tried to suggest, that, well, he literally became guilty of sin. No, if he literally had our sins imputed to him and he literally became guilty of sin, he's not a spotless lamb that is a worthy sacrifice, is he? I think the idea here is that either it is the sense in which he became a sin offering or I think there may be that sense in which he represented sin though he himself was sinless and as a result of that he offered atonement for our sin problem. And that allowed this God that is of purer eyes than to look upon uh, wickedness to become, as Paul would put it in Romans 3 and verse 26, just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ Jesus. Now friends, we are here tonight talking about that glorious message Because we're talking about that good news that the Bible describes and that call to a lost and dying world that it extends. I'd like us to read together a few passages. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And let's notice what Paul says to those in Thessalonica. Read with me verses 13 and 14. Paul says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, Beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Listen to this. To which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think with me about that. This message of salvation and atonement This means by which we can, sinners though we are, be made right with God through the blood of Jesus Christ is a message of good news that calls us unto salvation. Over in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, Peter will speak of this calling. And I want you to notice with me the sense in which it describes what we are called out of and what we are called into. Notice 1 Peter chapter 2 And verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of Him, listen, who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Now how does that come about? In Galatians, in Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul talks to us about the way in which we can accept and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice that it's not, well, faith or works. Notice it is something by which, through faith, we are obedient and we put on Christ. Notice Galatians 3, beginning in verse 26, For you are all sons of God. Through faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And notice the condition then that one can experience. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Let's look at one last text that talks to us about this call of the gospel. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and listen to how the Apostle Paul describes it. Let's begin in verse 8 and notice Paul says, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me his prisoner but share with me in his in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which we is, he has given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. I called your attention in this last reading. It describes a holy calling. And in all of these readings, it describes a calling unto a relationship with him. Did you notice there a chosen generation, a royal priesthood? This is one way of describing what the New Testament will describe as the Lord's church. That is one figure that is used to describe who the people are that are in this saved relationship of fellowship with him. This holy calling is unto fellowship, and church is not the only figure that will be used. Notice, it will be described as a body, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. It will be described as a family, Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 15. It will be described as a vine and branches, John 15, verses 1 through 8. It will be described as a flock, John 10, 1 through 16. It will be described as a building, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9. Or it will be described as specifically a building that is the temple, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. And it will be described as a kingdom, Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14. Now, I want you to notice here, in each of these things, are we talking about different people in different relationships with God? No. Each of these different descriptions are ways of describing the nature of that fellowship with God in Christ. And each of those figures teach us a little something different about its nature. Now our focus tonight and our focus throughout this week is on that one figure that I mentioned right at the beginning and that figure of the church. We probably are so accustomed to this that we don't think too much about it but did you recognize the fact or are you aware of the fact that really that is a figure that in the time in which it was used it was very similar to the idea of speaking of it as a kingdom, it, it was a political term. I want to talk for a few moments about what we could call two words that lie behind the figure of the church. Now, you may say, wait a minute, I, I'm familiar with one of those words. Most likely, we've all heard this particular word, ecclesia. But bear with me because we're actually going to look at another one that relates to this as well. 
This Greek word ekklesia was one that literally referred to an outcalling, or there are some scholars that now think that it may have some connection to a calling out from people. But either way, it is behind every use of the reference to the church that we find in our English Bibles. Now, as it was used in the first century, the Greeks would use it in reference to a a democratic political assembly within a, a, a given township. And we'll see one instance in which it's used that way in Acts chapter 19 and verse 39 of what is described as a a lawful assembly. But most often, and our focus throughout this week is not really upon the secular political usage of this term, but we want to understand what it means when it is describing assemblies or the assembly of disciples of Christ. Now that's the primary word, but there's another word I want to talk to you about as well. And that is a word from which our English word church is actually derived. It is the word kuriakos, and it literally means belonging to the Lord. But while our English word church is derived from this word, and it is a word that's used in the New Testament, ironically, it's not used in the New Testament of the assembly of disciples of Christ. You may say, well, what do you mean, Brother Pope? Well, this term means belonging to the Lord. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, will use it in reference to the Lord's day. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20, there the apostle Paul will use it in reference to the Lord's supper. Now you may say, well, wait a minute. If it's not used in reference to the assemblies of disciples of Christ, then why do we have that word? How has it come from this word to mean church? Well, scholars tell us that over time, this word eventually came to be applied to the Lord's household. In much the same way, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 will speak of the household of God. Now that's something that developed after the New Testament. In the New Testament, it just means belonging to the Lord. Now in early translations, when they tried to deal with these two words, and they tried to explain these concepts, of course, that word ecclesia is the word that refers to the assembly of disciples. Some of the earliest translations actually would just transliterate it. Now what that means is you don't really translate the concept, but you just bring it into the other language. And so in Gothic or in Latin, we'll see transliterations of the word ecclesia. But for some reason, in Germanic languages, and English is a a Germanic language, they seem to emphasize a little bit more this idea of kuriakos and what it developed to mean the church belonging to the Lord. I want you to notice here, you can see how it was written in German, you can see how it was written in Anglo-Saxon, and then in the last form there, you see the way that Wycliffe rendered it when he did it from the Latin Vulgate. It looks a little more like our word church, doesn't it? Now when you have the first English translations that were trying to translate the idea of ecclesia, It's interesting because the very first ones that came from the Greek, Tyndale, the Great Bible, and the Bishop's Bible, they actually translated it. In other words, they tried to bring the concept out, and so they'd have different spellings of the word congregation. But for whatever reason, when the Geneva Bible came along, and the Rasdue Bible, and the King James that we're very familiar with, they chose instead to use this word that had come from kuriakos and would put church. Now, let me make it clear. Am I saying that it's wrong to use that word church? No, I'm not saying that. Especially if we understand that it's derived from a concept that means belonging to the Lord. But I I think we should ask ourselves the question, have we brought worldly concepts about the church into our own views. Would it have been 
that if all English Bibles had simply translated it congregation or assembly, would there be concepts that we would avoid? Would we struggle with as many misconceptions as exist in our world today? Now you may say, well, Brother Pope, what do you mean by misconceptions? I want to go over just a handful of those with you tonight and look at what the Bible teaches. For example, all of us probably... You know, when you use that term church, because of the way after the New Testament, it eventually came to be applied to a building, even uh, within the Lord's church, a lot of people will wrestle with thinking in their mind that the building is the church. I want us to understand that in the New Testament, this word ecclesia is never used of a building. It is never used in that way. Now, let's make this clear. Did the ecclesia assemble? Yes, absolutely. It would assemble in the temple courts. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. It would assemble in private homes. Romans 16, verse 5 and elsewhere. It would assemble in Acts chapter 19 and verse 9 in something that's described the school of Tyrannus. And in an interesting example, in James chapter 2 and verse 2, it may actually be describing a building that a local church had set aside for that purpose. Now, most of our translations will simply say, if someone should come into your assembly, but it is the word sunagoge that most often in the New Testament is translated of the Jewish place of assembly. And it's possible that in James 2 it's using that of a place that a local church has, had designated in that way. Now, what are we saying? Well, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 clearly commands the ecclesia to assemble. So there is authority to secure a place for the ecclesia, but the place is not the church. Think with me about another misconception, and that is some will have the view that, well, you have the Lord's church that is made up of all sorts of different churches, made up of all sorts of different denominations, and they teach and practice different things. When you look into the New Testament, we don't see anything like that. We see Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 describing the fact that he would build his church, not his churches, and Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4 makes it very clear. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. As the New Testament portrays it, it's not that you've got all of these diverse kinds of things and all of these different denominations that all fit together somehow into one church. Now, how did we ever get to from what the New Testament teaches about one church that belongs to our Lord to a world that imagines that you can have the chaos that's all around us. Well, perhaps it's misunderstanding some concepts that are taught in Scripture. For example, you will see different senses in which the word ecclesia will be used. Over in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23, there it describes the glory that the Christian enjoys as he has come to the, the new Jerusalem, as he has come to uh, the, the place in which uh, the spirits of just men are made perfect, as he comes to the church of the firstborn, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Now, as we see that description, it's not limiting it to a, a given location. In fact, it's not even limiting it to those that are alive, it is including the living and the dead that are in fellowship with God in Christ. So in that sense, we could call that a universal sense in which the church is being referred to. And that becomes significant because who is the head of the church universally? There is no earthly headquarters, no earthly head. Christ alone is the head of the church in that sense. But you'll also see times in which the church will be used to used in reference to, or ecclesia will be used in reference to what could be called the local church. Acts chapter 11, verse 23, the church in Jerusalem. Revelation, Revelation 2 and verse 8, the church in 
Smyrna. I want you to think with me about it because the New Testament does teach an organization of appointed and qualified men over local congregations. You don't have elders and deacons over the church universally. You do have, however, appointed elders and deacons over local congregations. But there's a third way as well that this term can be used, and that is of an actual church assembled. When I'm baptized into Christ, as we read in Galatians chapter 3, I put on Christ, I am added to his body, but that doesn't mean I'm assembled in a local congregation. I may identify with a local congregation, but when I'm working my job, am I assembled in that local congregation? No. Colossians chapter 4 verse 16 gives instruction that that epistle was to be read in the church of the Laodiceans. Remember, it doesn't mean building. It means when they're actually assembled. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18, the church in Corinth was having some problems. And one of those problems was they had turned the Lord's Supper into just a common social meal. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But there he describes in chapter 11 and several times in chapter 14 what they are to do when they come together in the church. And what is meant is when they're assembled together as the local church assembled. I think some of the reason perhaps that folks have wrestled with this idea that, well, you can have one large church that's made up of different denominations is they fail to understand this universal, local, or assembled sense in which the terms can be used. But another reason perhaps that folks wrestle with this is because there are a number of different names that can be applied to the Lord's church as it's described in the New Testament. For example, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 and elsewhere, you'll see it called simply the church of God. You'll see in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15, the church of the living God. And in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 23 that I referred to a few moments ago, there it is described as the church of the firstborn. Now you'll notice I point out a little something on the chart there, that it is plural in form. I've got to thank Brother John Gentry for pointing out something to me some years ago. I had assumed looking at this, firstborn must mean simply a reference to Christ, but it is rather describing those who are his in Christ that receive that position of inheritance as firstborn. You'll see in Romans 16 and verse 16, there local congregations being referred to as churches of Christ, or 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen, churches of God. Now, some will look at that and go, okay, see, you've got all sorts of different organizations and groups. Is that right? No, I challenge you to realize that these are not formal titles that are distinct organizations or denominations. These are descriptions of ownership. These are descriptions of identity. But what we're talking about is one church that belonged to the Lord. Division is condemned. Uh, Departure from doctrine is condemned. And in fact, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 17 of his ways in Christ that he taught them everywhere in every church. Well, let's think about a third misconception. And I have to say that this is sad because some, even among us, more and more are becoming willing to speak of the church of Christ as a denomination. Historically, it hadn't been that way. Historically, at least in the United States, those that have attempted to be simply churches that belong to Christ, they have rejected any kind of denominational label, and yet more and more people just seem to kind of give in to that and say, yeah, of course, we are a denomination. Back in 1962, Brother Ed Harrell wrote a little booklet called The Emergence of the Church of Christ Denomination. And sadly, so many of those things that he warned us about have come true and have come to be realized among members of the church. Where I preach in Amarillo, Texas, the oldest congregation in town that identifies itself simply 
as the church of Christ has fallen prey to this. They proudly participate in cooperative efforts with Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian congregations with no effort to distinguish truth from error. And I fear that part of the reason for this is not because somehow we're trying to influence or somehow we're trying even to simply attain biblical concepts of unity, I fear that we look at these groups around us and we begin to think, look how big they are. Look at what they do. And we have the problem that the Israelites had in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 5. We want to be like the nations all around us. Is that what God wants of his people? Is that what his church ought to be? The Bible teaches that we are to be distinct from the world. And let's illustrate that by noticing a few passages that speak to us about the relationship that we're to have with those that are in sin, that are in error. Notice in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 14, and if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Now think with me about that. If that's the posture we are to take towards a brother individually that is in sin and not following what we read about in the New Testament, what is our posture to be towards entire groups that do not follow what we find within the New Testament? Second John, notice verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. I realize that perhaps... The objective, the goal with some of this may be, well, we want unity. Yes, we do want unity, but it must be on the basis of the doctrine of Christ. And if we embrace and tolerate and accept that which is contrary to the doctrine of Christ, notice the warning here, we can share in the evil deeds. If that is true of our relationship to individuals that do this, how can it not be? if we simply embrace a denominational concept? Are we interested in pleasing God? Or are we interested in pleasing man? Are we like the Jews that are described in John 12 and verse 43 who love the praise of men more than the praise of God? Well, I think a fourth misconception that some wrestle with is the idea that, well, the church and the kingdom are different groups. At the beginning, as we began to talk about this relationship that we have, being called out of darkness into a relationship with God and Christ, do you remember some of the things that we observed about figures that are used to describe this relationship? We noticed it is Christ, described as Christ's body, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. It is described as his family, Ephesians 3, 14 through 15. It is described as his flock, John 10, 1 through 16, or his kingdom, Colossians 1, 13 through 14. Now, in different circles and for different reasons, there have been times in which people have said, wait, we've got to distinguish the Lord's church from the Lord's kingdom. Now, among those who embrace the concept of premillennialism, they have to do that because they don't believe that the Lord uh, was successful in establishing a kingdom when he first came and that the church kind of was uh, established as a stopgap measure, but sometime off in the future, he's actually going to succeed and then establish his kingdom. So if you've got that view, you have to say the church and the kingdom are something different. There are others that would, would not hold to that view, but they'll look at the fact that there are some different ways that these figures describe the nature of the relationship. And as they look at that, I think they make the false conclusion that, well, if there are different figures or different aspects, that must mean that they're different things. Let me illustrate it to you. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 38, you have there the explanation of the parable of the wheat and tares, which reads, the field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Now, here, given the fact that this realm and domain 
is so broad that it is describing the world and it's only the sons of the kingdom that are within it, some would see that as distinct from the way in which the church is described. I think we need to understand that as the figure of the kingdom is used, it's emphasizing realm, it's emphasizing reign, it's emphasizing jurisdiction. Yes, if we are now all under law toward Christ, if he is now king over all, all are obligated to obey him. Only those that do are sons of the kingdom. But we're not talking about something that is distinct group of people. Specific aspects will be applied to different figures. And I think we recognize that with some of the other figures. For example, do we have problems with the fact that the kingdom has no elders or deacons, at least when that figure's being used? Now, that doesn't mean that they're distinct things. Or think about this. A temple doesn't have branches. Now, do we struggle with saying, well, the temple must be a different group of people than the vine? No. It is not talking about different people. It's talking about different aspects of the relationship that the Lord would have us to understand. Well, a fifth misconception that I think we sometimes wrestle with, and I think more and more we're seeing this in the world around us as well, is that the church should not be emphasized. Sometimes you'll hear it expressed in one way or another that comes out about like this. Emphasize Christ, not the church. Now, this can come from many different circles. It may be that you'll hear some that have left the Lord's church, and as they cite why it is that they left, they will be upset or they'll be frustrated over conflicts or differences that have pertained to the work and the functioning of the church. And so they say, you know, the problem was just too much emphasis upon the church. There are others that might not view it that way, but they imagine that, well, we can be so much more successful in terms of evangelism if we just start emphasizing Christ and, and don't spend so much time talking about what the church ought to do and what it, not, it, it shouldn't do. Now, still others may not wrestle with either one of those problems, but how do you talk about the church? Is it something in which... Your children hear you bad-mouthing the church every chance you get? Is it something in which you're talking down its leadership? You're talking down its worship? You're talking down its distinctive natures compared to the world? Or is it something in which local congregations are making choices that minimize the times in which we ever are even together as a local church? The result of all of these things serves to say, well, let's emphasize these other things. Let's emphasize Christ, but not emphasize the church. What does the New Testament say? Well, remember, we are described as members of Christ's body, Ephesians 5, verse 30. Ephesians 3, verses 14 and 15, and Hebrews 2, verse 11, we are described as the family of God. Now, Yes, we're talking about people. Are those people in these local congregations flawless? No. We're going to say the wrong things. We're going to do the wrong things. We're going to have attitudes that need to be shaped and corrected, and we need to mature. But that doesn't change the fact that as Titus 2, verse 14 teaches, 1 Peter 2, verse 9, we are a special people. Now, why is that the case? Is that because, well, just inherently, you know, we're, we're a special kind of people? No, we are a special people because God has set us apart unto himself. Acts 20, verse 32, and elsewhere. This assembly of disciples of Jesus Christ who are called by the gospel into this holy calling of fellowship with him are special we should appreciate it. We should respect its work and its leadership. We should respect and value and treasure its identity. Do we fail to realize that we should honor it? And if we dishonor it, 
We are dishonoring God. It is something that belongs to him. He established it. And more than that, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 19, Christ purchased it with his blood. If you're talking about something that was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, we're talking about something that we must emphasize. We're talking about something that we should treat as special. Now, I don't know that this is definitely the case, but I fear that often we may have come to this position in which we so readily de-emphasize it because we fail to understand some things about the background that lies behind these concepts of the Lord's church. Now, yes, it's true that the church established by Jesus Christ with him acting as the atoning sacrifice was not established until Acts chapter 2. Now, does that mean that this concept of a congregation that belongs to the Lord, or even this Greek term, ekklesia, was that brand new that no one had ever heard it before? Absolutely not. I cite several passages here, and I could have put many others, but language scholar Jack P. Lewis, in some work that he's done in the theological word book of the Old Testament, has addressed a few different words that were used in the Hebrew Old Testament for various congregations. One that was more casual, one that was much more of what he'll call a representative assembly. And he will notice the fact that this term, congregation of the Lord, it uses the Hebrew word kahal. And when it is used, he'll describe it as being the closest to the ecclesia of the Lord that you'll find. And what's interesting about this is this word, it, it had special rules. Who could be a part of this kahal assembly? There are regulations about who could and could not. There were rules about what was to be done. Now, my point with all of this is that when Jesus chose to use the term ecclesia, he was using a word that the Greek Old Testament had used in reference to that special assembly of the Lord in the Old Testament. And I think in the first century, people would have understood, we're not just talking about something you take casually. We're talking about something that would have been special. Let's look at two final misconceptions, and then the lesson will be yours. Some have said that, well, what the individual can do, the church can do. Now, that sounds good, doesn't it? But do we really believe that? You know, I can, I, I'm married a beautiful woman. We've been married for a long time. Can the church marry now, I recognize the church is described as the bride of Christ, but, you know, as a result of our marriage, we, we have children, and we discipline those children. Can the church carry out corporal punishment on children? And those are just a couple of examples that we could look at. That, you know, as an individual, I could start a business, couldn't I? Is the church granted authority because I can do it as an individual to establish some business? And most of these things we look at and we say, yeah, I, I realize that, that distinction. The, the church just can't do everything that the individual Christian can do. But friends, this distinction is at the heart of the institutional division that took place in the last century and continues today. And we'll find even among our own brethren, sometimes it will come up. I want to offer a text to you that I think illustrates this distinction so clearly. We mentioned a few moments ago 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we mentioned the problem that the church in Corinth had. They were abusing the Lord's Supper to the extent that they were te treating it as a common meal. You had some people that were going home hungry, others that were full, and Paul offers a rebuke of this in verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 11, and he says this, What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God? Now let me ask the question, was it inherently sinful to eat food? No. Was it even inherently sinful for Christians to eat food with one another? In Acts chapter 2, it describes them breaking bread from house to house. 
But I want you to notice that as Paul is addressing it here in the context of what they did in the ecclesia, in the assembly, he describes there in verse 22 that when they did it in that context, it was to despise the church of God. And in fact, in verse 34, he gives a remedy. The way in which that distinction is to be made. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. There it's talking about the individual. Lest you come together for judgment. I think that makes it very clear that that we're not talking about something in which everything that the individual can do, the church can do. And that's true whether we're talking about, you know, can I as an individual choose some human institution that I think is worthy of my support? Yes. Can the local church? No. The last one I want to offer to you is perhaps one of the most fundamental in terms of the very definition that we're talking about when we're talking about this relationship in the Lord's church, this relationship being called out of darkness into light. And that is, some will wrestle with the idea that, well, I I just don't like religion. I just don't like this church uh, kind of concept. And I want to be saved, but I don't want to have to worry about being involved in any kind of local church. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, over to Acts chapter 2. Now, I'm going to read from the New King James. And if you read from the New King James or from the Old King James, you're going to find something very similar. But if you read from virtually any other English translation, you're going to see a distinction. And I'm going to point that out to you, and I want to talk a little bit about that for a moment. Read with me Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to, notice, the church, New King James and Old King James have it, daily those who were being saved. Now, if you read from another translation, you probably saw something closer to this. The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who, who were being saved. And this is from the New American Standard version. Now, why is that the case? Some of you may be familiar with this issue. The reason is, while the majority of Greek manuscripts, including uh, a Syriac translation, a very ancient Syriac translation, has this phrase added uh, to the church, some early Greek manuscripts do not have that, as well as some early translations, such as the Vulgate, I think Coptic as well. Now, that has led some to think, okay, well, if this doesn't say to the church there, does that distinguish those who are the saved from the group that is identified as the church? And I want to answer that simply, no. All you have to do is read a few chapters further in the book of Acts, and in Acts chapter 5 and verse 11, it's still talking about those that obeyed the gospel on the day of Pentecost that worked together in fellowship in Jerusalem, and in Acts chapter 5 verse 11, the same group is described as the church. But as I was preparing this lesson, I came across a little something else that I think even further addresses this issue, and it goes directly to this misconception about can I be saved but not be a part of the Lord's church. My understanding is that all of the Greek manuscripts, whether you're talking about those few earlier ones or you're talking about the majority, actually have this little phrase that I've put on the screen for you there. It is, uh, we pronounce it epito auto. Now, literally, you could render it over the same. But scholars have come to understand that the way in which this phrase is used, it has kind of an idiomatic meaning. In other words, there's a special way that it seems to be used in a number of different contexts. Some will describe it as kind of a quasi or semi-technical term that often is used in connection with the congregation of the church in assembly. And I offer just a few examples to you here 
in Acts chapter 1 and elsewhere, 1 Corinthians 1 and elsewhere. And Bruce Metzger, as he explains this, he explains it this way and says that it signifies the union of the Christian body and perhaps could be rendered in the church fellowship. Now, some will bump this phrase into the beginning of chapter 3, but it still makes the same point. Now, what does all this have to do with anything? What are you uh, explaining this Greek phrase to us for, Brother Pope? Well, the reason is because whether to the church reiterates the same point or not, if they are correct in their understanding of the usage of this phrase, it is describing the church. And so it is saying the same thing. Friends, what we've got to understand is that as the New Testament describes it, the church is those who are in a saved relationship with God in Christ. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23 that we've talked about several times tonight, the church of the firstborn, notice, who are registered in heaven. We can't have this concept that, well, I can be, a, I can be in fellowship with Christ, I can have a relationship with him, but I don't have to be a part of his body. You know, if we think about the other figures, could we say, well, you know, I, I want to be, I want to have a relationship with the shepherd, but I don't want to be a part of the flock. I want to be a part of the building. Uh, I want to be a stone, but I don't want to be a part of the building. <laughs> no, none of those work. And the same thing is true with this idea. The most important need that any one of us have is the need of salvation. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, when the angel appeared to Joseph and talked to him about the child that would be born to his wife to whom he was betrothed, the angel said, she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save the people from their sins. You know, in this very word Jesus, which as I understand it, is the Greek form of the word Joshua, there is a description of the very purpose of Jesus coming. The Hebrew Yeshua, which this word comes into Greek that way, it means Jehovah or Yahweh is salvation. His very name describes what he, what he accomplishes for his people. In two passages in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27 to begin with, in the situation where the disciples are with Jesus in the boat when a storm arises and Jesus is sleeping and they wake him up and say, Lord, save us. We are perishing. Then in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 33, you'll remember as Jesus walks on the water and Peter at first has the courage and the faith to be able to step out on the waves, but then as he grows afraid, he cries out and said, Lord, save me. Each of us, we need to recognize our need for salvation. Maybe in your life, you need to cry out, Lord, save me. And we've talked tonight about the way in which that can happen. And I hope that if you need a Savior, Jesus Christ, you will act upon that before it is too late. You will obey that call out of darkness, the darkness of sin, into a saved relationship with God and Christ through putting your faith in Jesus as the Son of God, confessing that faith before men, repenting of sin that separates you from God, and then being baptized into Christ that you might put on Christ. And when that happens, the Lord will add you to his church. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I want to thank Brother Kyle, did a great job tonight and uh, always does for us. Uh, Kyle does a lot of work for the organization and I'd be remiss to not also thank him for that. If you get a chance to talk with him this week, I would invite you to. 
Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge uh, about so much, and uh, especially when it comes to our publications and uh, the great work that he has done to edit and format and bring those things into print. I want to mention just a few closing announcements tonight, and then Mark will also come and make some closing remarks. Uh, got a lot of kids here tonight. Like seeing that. Uh, and you might notice if you picked up one of the schedules, on the back of the schedule, there'll be a children's class at 11 a.m. tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday. That'll be in the library. Uh, as you exit out of the auditorium, before you go out the side uh, doors back toward the parking lot, if you turn back into the school hallway, you can't miss the library. It's right there to the right. Uh, and our staff can help you find that too. But I hope these kids will come back and be a part of that um, if they get a chance uh, during the week. I also want to remind you about the book. I know you'll see it coming in, and you're going to see it throughout the week. Uh, but this week, it'll be $20 for each of the books. Uh, this has been put together with a lot of care and a lot of work out of these men, and they'll appreciate you uh, taking this home with you and uh, continuing to study on it and share it with others. And then I want to mention one other thing, and that is the Worshiping with the Psalms Psalter. Uh, the, the, salt, the psalm that we sang tonight, that was beautiful, uh, really enjoyed that, and uh, this is a, a full book of it. We've got these out there for you to see and to purchase as well, and also the slides, the slides that you saw tonight, uh, you can purchase that full slide set uh, of Worshiping with the Psalms, uh, so check that out too, that's a digital download, so you got to do that through our website, but we'd love to, to help you do that, so you can share that with your congregation as well. I want to thank you for coming. Great crowd, great start to the 2023 Truth Lectures. Hope to see you back in the morning, bright and early, right? 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, we'll get kicked off with the Tuesday lectures then. Mark. Thank you, Kyle. I always learn something from Brother Cal, Kyle Pope. Uh, he has a wealth of knowledge, but he's able to communicate it in a way that uh, we can understand and that we can benefit uh, the sessions tomorrow, just for the sake of those that may not be mindful, that at 8 o'clock, uh, Brother Marshall McDaniel will speak to us on the Chosen of God. Uh, at 9 o'clock, Jeff Wilson from uh, the Houston area will, a will ans ask and answer the question, is there a pattern? At 10, Brother Brent Forsyth uh, will address the subject of the Restoration Movement then and now the historical view and bring it to the present. And then at the 11 o'clock hour, we will begin, we will have the session that will have both a male, a, a men's and a women's track. Uh, the women's track will be back here down the hallway uh, and in the cafeteria area. Uh, Deborah Williams will be speaking on promoting unity within the local church. And I will be addressing that theme here in the auditorium for the men. So we will have the classes for the children at that time as well to free up the mothers so that they can uh, attend to the lecture itself and then we will uh, also follow that up with a 45 minute potentially long potentially long 45 minute uh, session of question and answer in that practical track each day of the week at the 11 o'clock hour so that last year was very effective in here is practical application of truth and interacting and having input from the audience and questions and answers proved to be very useful. Uh, we're going to be dismissed by Brother Rody Gumpod, a, a beloved brother in Christ who has been preaching the gospel in the Philippines for over 40 years. He is here with, with his family, with his son, Junior, uh, and we are, we're thankful for him to be in our midst. I've labored with him on a number of occasions. Ron has labored with him on countless occasions. But let's stand, and Brother Gumpod will lead us in dismissal prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> our great God, loving and merciful Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving each one of us the chance and opportunity to come and be together and uh, to sing these songs, to worship thee, and to hear these wonderful lessons like the one that has been explained well to us this evening. Thank you, Father, for giving us this understanding so that we can learn more how to serve you and preserve our faith in thee. For we really want.
to reach heaven someday. Loving Father, with all these lessons that we just have heard this evening, it is a very good reminder to all of us. And with all those plans that has been uh, projected and all fulfilled to our Lord Jesus, so that in due time, according to your purpose, the church has been built. And we understand that it's based upon your godly calling to all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether Americans, Filipinos, Russians, Chinese, or any race of this world, that if they will listen to the pure gospel of our Lord Jesus, you will give them the power to become as your children. Thank you so much, Father, that you gave us this understanding so that we can understand that this church is very important because it is where you are adding every soul who are obeying the gospel, who are being baptized for the remission of their sins. And we could easily understand, Father, and that's why we are so thankful that by that way, you made us one in Christ. Loving Father, one time we are not worthy to call you Father because of our sins. We are rivals against you. And we are very far away. But you seek us. You love us. And we praise thy wonderful name, Father, because now, after obedience of each one of us, you gave us that opportunity, that chance. And we can call you now, Father, as we are now members in that one family, in that one kingdom, in that one church, in that one body, which Christ is the head. Loving Father, now we pray that while we are waiting for your coming to come and get us, Satan is very, very active also in trying to destroy us. And so many has been already dropped down. But we are so thankful that we are all here this evening, Father. It is because we want to strengthen that faith and relationship that we have in Christ. And with all these lessons, we pray, Father, that you may bless so that it may continue to educate us with all these informations, many lessons will make us stronger in our service unto thee. It is now our prayer, loving Father, that uh, you may help each one of us because this church, you call it as a glorious church without blemish, holy, and we understand that that is the classification of every member of the church. Loving Father, we are bowing our heads before thee this moment. Like the psalmist, it is now our prayer that please search us, know our thoughts, and if there are any sins that we have committed, and if we have shortcomings, and if our daily living is not right with thee, Father, please help us. Give us a humble heart. Help us to follow the example of our Lord Jesus. Give us a spirit of obedience to all the world that we could only focus to obey and do thy will. It is because we want to be saved. Loving Father, 
I don't know the needs of everyone this moment. But you know, because you are a wise and powerful God, you can search our hearts and minds. So now, Father, we pray that you may bless each one of us, bless even the children that are here, the young people that are here who are wanting to be part in this family, in this glorious church, that they may grow and that they may uh, uh, help to maintain the purity of the church and of this uh, uh, teaching, of the, of the teaching of this church. And that we ask also that you may continue to bless even the older people, the older ones, preachers or non-preachers that are here. We have a one common purpose, Father. We are bowing our heads, humbling ourselves to you. And we want you to guide. We want you to teach us. We want you to help us uh, make our daily living holy and, and not blemish because we want to be worthy at any time that you will come. Loving Father, we pray that you may continue to bless this uh, program. Uh, there are more days to come. This is only the beginning. And we thank you that uh, uh, you help us. But those that are still coming, those that are on their way, we pray that you may help them, guide and protect them so that they can also uh, may safely reach uh, this place. And we will be together in the few more days that as planned that we will stay and continue to study the words in this place. Thank you so much, Father. We expect more blessings from thee. As we ask all these things sincerely and with hope, in Jesus' precious name, amen.